Hey everyone, really excited to, to go through this, this session. Uh, questions we get a, a ton about open telemetry, Flint bid, and, and how, how folks should be thinking about observability. And uh, while we're not gonna answer every single question uh, today, at least hopefully we can we can uh, give some perspective on, on special use cases, give some uh, really unique views and uh, hopefully answer some of the, uh, the stuff going on. Go ahead and share my screen here. And yeah, for folks who don't know, I'm one of the Flimpit maintainers, um, also one of the folks at, at Calyptia. And of course, uh, Braden, maybe you want to give a quick intro as well? Yeah, so uh, my name is Braden Keynes. I'm a software developer at Google Cloud. Um, specifically, I'm working on a team called Instrumentation and Telemetry. Uh, and our goal is to make uh, telemetry collection and the observability experience the best we can for Google Cloud customers. and our strategy is that the best way to do that for Google Cloud customers is to make it better for everyone. So I spend a lot of time in open source projects trying to make sure that the general public experience for observability is as good as it can possibly be. Awesome. And yeah, I guess for today's agenda, we'll, uh, Brendan will run through a little bit of what open telemetry is. Uh, we'll show a little of how this stuff can can work together. We'll talk a little bit about integration in the broader ecosystem, talk a little bit about schemas, um, and then jump into things around the data format. Uh, Brandon's got a good wish list. Uh, maybe for, for future folks too, if you've got a good wish list for Fluent Pit, the best way is to put it on a webinar and get it recorded. So we're committed to, to getting that outcome. Uh, and then the last one is uh, kind of some, hey, wh wh how do you how do you start choosing instrumentation? How do you start making some of these decisions? Um, but with that, maybe, uh, Britt, I'll, I'll hand it off to you to kick us yeah, off. Yeah, great. Uh, so I'm going to start by quickly talking about sort of a general, so we can have a general understanding of what observability is, like what are we talking about in case you're new to it. Um, Generally, I consider observability, I, I, I should have realized I wasn't controlling the presentation because I made it like a click for point. Um, <laughs> um, so you can just click all the points if you want and then I'll read oh, them sure. out. Um, yeah, here, uh, I, can, I can stop sharing and, and you can- Okay, sure, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll take over. Where were we? Here. Yeah, so, um, if you're new to observability, I'm gonna give sort of my definition of what observability is. It's to uh, collect data about your system uh, that allows you to know how your service or system is behaving in production. Oftentimes production is kind of uh, behind, a, behind a glass wall. You know, we, can, we wanna be able to look in, but we can't always access it directly. So we wanna make sure we're collecting data from it that lets us sort of get a picture of how it's working and making sure it's okay. Um, the three most popular signals uh, to to gather information about a running system would be logs or sort of the oldest, uh, most tried and true tried and true signal. Um, metrics are very common, which are usually uh, time series data points that you can put together on a graph to get dashboards like the picture on the bottom right. Um, and traces are uh, a new up and coming signal, distributed traces where you can start a trace on your distributed system and have each point in the system record what are called spans, uh, record a little little bits about every piece of work together to then send to a backend that can aggregate all the spans that are part of a trace and give you a picture of how a certain operations are operating. And that's how you get sort of these like distribution graphs like this. You can get a lot of really interesting, uh, interesting dashboards out of proper distributed tracing. Um, the best possible observability for your system, in my opinion, is when you can actually use these signals together and correlate them. Uh, if you have a dashboard or you have alerts on metrics and you can see that you're having some sort of spike that you're not expecting uh, at a certain point in time, you can easily go and expect logs and traces from that time or start to look at other metrics around it. Um, so knowing, uh, being able to come up with a picture of an event that happened at a point in time by putting the signals together is, in my opinion, the best possible uh, setup for observability. Uh, but there are a lot of challenges with setting this up it's some people's full-time job to set up observability uh, on their systems like this. Uh, the biggest one is over time, it is three, there are three different signals and there have been lots of different collection and instrumentation strategies for all of them. Uh, they usually had completely different separate solutions for them. So you would 
even Google Cloud, for example, my team uh, maintains a, a two legacy agents, a legacy logging and a legacy monitoring agent, which do completely different things to collect logs and metrics. Whereas my team now is, uh, a, we now have an agent called the ops agent, which uh, does both at once, but even still under the hood, we are currently using two agents. We have fluent bit for log collection and open telemetry for metric collection. So in the past, there hasn't really been a good unified way to collect all the different types of signals. Uh, there are also lots of different proprietary formats. Um, every vendor just kind of came up with their own way to send data and it made it so that it was really hard to either switch collection strategies or especially switching vendors. Uh, you get very locked in very easily because it's so sticky to move off of one of these proprietary formats. There it is. I don't know why the slide wasn't changing. Uh, so this is where the open telemetry project comes in. Uh, you might've heard a lot of different definitions for open telemetry. Um, if you're at different sort of parts of the stack, it's possible that if you've heard whispers about open telemetry, your interpretation of it is different about what it actually is. And that's because open telemetry is a pretty wide reaching project. It's actually a lot of different things. Um, the, at the top level, it's really about being a unified data model. Um, for logs, metrics, and traces, there is a, a, a set data model for all three of them that are all very similar. And you can collect, you know, OT, open telemetry data. And whether you're looking at logs, metrics, or traces, you know, it's still it's all kind of under the same roof, which is the first time I'm aware of that this sort of has really happened. And it makes correlation and using them together a lot easier. And it makes transporting them to different places a lot easier. And speaking of transportation, the next sort of step is that there is a protocol specification. So not just the data model itself, but also the protocol for transferring this data. Uh, it's called OTLP or Open Telemetry Protocol. Um, and it's sort of the answer to the vendor lock-in is the, that's kind of kind of the dream is that if you have your data in, OT, in Open Telemetry format and you can communicate over OTLP, it's not super important who you're sending that data to, as long as you all speak the same language. Um, the, many people are probably aware that OpenTelemetry is also a set of libraries and SDKs for a lot of popular languages that allow you to send OTLP data directly from your applications. So if you are uh, ready to you know, change the code of your application, uh, sorry. Um, if you're able to uh, change the code of your application, you're willing to instrument it specifically to get specific application insights, then you can use the open telemetry libraries to send OTLP data to anywhere that is capable of receiving it. Um, there's also automatic instrumentation. If you use one of the most popular languages such as Java or Python, uh, there's, I think for other languages too, I haven't looked actually, but uh, for automatic instrumentation, uh, there's a lot of auto, uh, strategies for setting up an automatic, um, like, like if you have a Java app running, there's some strategies for installing automatic instrumentation. You can automatically get specific signals out of your JVM or out of your application if it knows how to speak the right language. So you don't have to change your code at all to start getting metrics out of it. Um, and finally, the uh, open telemetry collector uh, is an application that is designed to actually collect either collect data directly from a system or to be run externally for different sources to send data to. So open telemetry collector, if you're familiar with FluentBit, it's kind of an analog to it. It's a, you can run it as an agent directly on systems uh, or you can run it externally and send data to it. Uh, Anurag, did you wanna take this slide or, or the next one? Sorry. Yeah, abs absolutely. So I'll go ahead and um, similarly, go ahead and share my screen here. Yep. And you know, th yeah, thanks, Braden, for for going over what open telemetry is. One thing that will be good to now cover here is what does the actual integration look like, right? So now you now we know that open telemetry is solving for some of the challenges that happen within observability. We have a un unified data format for the major signals. We have a protocol. Um, how does this pair in with how you might be using FluentBit today? And really there's uh, two main ways. And you can think of it as 
FluentBit has a set of plugins where you're reading from sources, whether it's a file, whether it's from a local local system, and it's sending data maybe to a backend storage provider like block storage, maybe a columnar store, maybe a highly indexed store, and whatever it may be. In the same way for open telemetry integration, we can read those signals, so the inputs from OTEL, and then we can send out uh, to, to OTEL compatible endpoints. So really becoming a good citizen within that ecosystem that's defined, uh, whether that's the schema, whether that's the protocol, um, and, and even some methods on how do we go about collecting some of that. Now, the other nice thing here too, is like there, the ways that you're running Fluent Bit today can plug in or have um, open telemetry almost immediately. There's no restriction. They can only use open telemetry in an agent mode with Fluent or aggregator mode with Fluent. Uh, you can eff effectively add it as a, as a plugin right side by side with uh, how you're already running the application today. So what we'll show here in the, the next, uh, next um, demo is a little bit of how does this actually all work? What's the actual use case of this stuff integrating together? Uh, and if it's all integrating together, you know, what else can I do uh, besides just connecting these things um, and connecting all these pieces? So with that, let's start with what the integration looks like. And so what I'll show here in a little bit is a system that has fluent bit running just as we, we might already have running within our ecosystem. Uh, we have an application. Uh, in this case, that application is running side by side, but it doesn't need to be. It's instrumenting itself using some of the OTEL libraries that uh, Brayden mentioned. And from there, if we're instrumenting those, those libraries, we're sending it um, via the open telemetry protocol into Fluent. And then from Fluent, because we also integrate with things like Prometheus and open metrics, open telemetry, we're taking those OTEL metrics and exposing them so they can be scraped by another ecosystem or CNCF project, Prometheus. Last but not least, from a visualization side, because if I just show terminal, it'd be pretty boring today. Um, a little bit of Grafana there just to say, hey, what, what are we pulling? How, do we, how are we showing this? Um, and we also have some, some Jaeger dashboards as well. So with that, let me go ahead and I'll start off with, the, with a little bit of the boring stuff, the terminal, just so we can see what's, what's going on, right? We're talking about all this integration. Sometimes it's just useful to dive into a config file uh, and, and get, get a sense of, okay, I have Flint bit, it's collecting. What does this look like from, a, from an integration side? Okay, so what I'll go ahead and do is open up the config file. Increase the size there. And what I'm see, uh, let me refresh the browser real quick. The great part about these web browsers, web browser terminals is they're easy to share. Uh, just as soon as I increase the size, you've got to uh, refresh the screen and whatnot. Okay, awesome. So for those who are familiar with Fluent Bits configuration, uh, this is not going to look any like anything too strange, right? You have a set of inputs, you have a set of outputs. We can even have a set of filters, uh, and 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 effectively, these inputs are grabbing data, collecting data, receiving data. The filters are processing or changing or enriching, looking up data, and then the outputs are are sending that. Now, in the case of Open Telemetry, what we've done with Fluent Bit is say logs tr get treated as a separate signal. You have metrics treated as a separate signal and then uh, traces uh, treated like a separate si signal. And so from this side, what we're doing is we have an input of open telemetry and say, hey, just like we receive maybe syslog, just like we receive TCP, we're creating a port uh, for open telemetry that'll receive logs, metrics, or traces on this port 8080. Uh, we're even scraping some Prometheus metrics. So we're grabbing and, and looking and, and, and uh, receiving some, some metrics there. And then from the output side, it's firing these metrics over. So uh, in this case, I also have a I have an OTEL collector, right? So the integration doesn't just mean it's one or the other. You might have some collectors running. We might have some fluid bit running. Uh, here I'm firing off logs, metrics, traces, I'm sending this to the collector. And I'm also taking some of those same metrics and I'm exposing them 
um, via the Prometheus exporter. So firing, um, excuse me, are exposing a lot of those metrics. So if, if something is scraping or collecting from there, uh, it'll be able to, to collect and, and visualize that data from the Grafana dashboard. Now that's uh, that's running on my system here um, alongside my, my other demo app, which is a very simple JavaScript or uh, JavaScript app. And what I'll go ahead and do now is we will go into my Grafana dashboard, oops. And within Grafana, um, right, we are collecting all this data in from, from Hotel to, we go back to this architecture diagram, we're firing some Hotel metrics. And those Hotel metrics literally are just saying, hey, this thing is running, it's up, it's down. Very, very simple metric. Then we have Prometheus coming along and, and scraping that metric. So from this side, in Grafana, I'm going to go into my dashboards, click into demo, my basic service traces. And here it's you know giving us a, a duration for uh, collecting uh, collecting that very, very specific metric um, that's coming in. So you can see a very simple integration, how you might use it in practice. Maybe someone on the team is saying, hey, we've got a bunch of Prometheus metrics to go collect. We've got a bunch of uh, Otel traces metrics that we want to fire over. How can they integrate with some of the existing tooling that we have? And we can start to leverage the existing inputs and outputs, similar to what you already have in, in FluentBit, uh, to go do some of those, um, those collections. And similarly, I'll open up the Jaeger um, side. Now here we'll be able to also you know, grab some, some traces too. So, if we want to go look at like what's happening, what's happening, like what is what is coming from the span, we're still able to do um, similarly all of that uh, that as well. So from this perspective, right, we're grabbing some metrics, we're exposing, collecting those, visualizing them. Uh, integration is really uh, meant to be plug in plug and play, right? We're there's absolutely things that are going to be uh, you know coming and 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 going and as as the ecosystem continues to mature too, right? Especially with around logs, uh, we'll we'll see see more of that. There's some good questions uh, in the in the Q and A that I want to make sure that we can hit on. Um, so the first one have a clear example of some FluentBit in Kubernetes consuming Java logs. Uh, you know this would be great. Strong on this. We won't be covering that directly in this session. Uh, that being said. You know, we, we'll talk a little bit about schematization with open telemetry schematization uh, just right after this. Uh, but this is a great topic for another session um, or another webinar. And we're always looking for more topics. So please, like, just like, um, you know, Kirk has done here, we love it. Like, please, if you want to see something, might not be in this session, maybe it's in, in something that we cover next year. Uh, now, now Mani Kantan has asked another one. Can I capture hotel traces from a Kubernetes pod container? Like I collect other application logs like stack traces. Oh, this is a, this is a really, really excellent question. So almost like uh, if I can go through maybe a little bit of, of the history of, of uh, Kubernetes side is when Kubernetes writes to, um, uh, writes to a, a file in, in or when I'm running a pod, it's writing in standard out and standard error onto the node itself. And then from there, FluentBit is reading those node-based logs. It's doing a bit of enrichment by talking to the Cube API server and then firing those logs um, out. Now, the same thing is, I think, being discussed from a tracing and metric perspective of writing those things to file. Uh, FluentBit now supports metrics. Uh, it, it supports uh, scraping directly from the Cube API server. There's a great blog post uh, that we can link in the chat for, for that. Uh, we also support um, grabbing prom metrics from a file itself. So you can read, if you have all those metrics being uh, sent to a file, there is a, there a way, way to do that too. From the trace side, that's not there today, um, but we have heard this, so it, it is something that uh, we, we definitely want to, uh, to, to go. The follow-up question will be there, is there an out-of-the-box OTEL fluent bit parser? Ooh, this is, uh, it's almost like uh, you're, you're helping uh, me with the, the next thing that I want to talk about, which is the OTEL and FluentBit schema. 
So we have the, the integration side and, and collecting all the data. Um, how does it fit within the broader CNCF ecosystem? Right, again, as, as Brady mentioned, there's a ton of tooling out there, a ton of instrumentation. Uh, how can we make it as compatible as possible? So if you've got the investments here, we plug into all the new stuff that you might want to explore or try. Uh, and, and this is a really fun one. This is actually in collaboration with the uh, Open Search uh, project. It's a uh, highly uh, a search analytic platform, open source, a, a kind of spun out of uh, Elasticsearch. And uh, as part of that, there was some, some dashboarding and within open telemetry itself, there was a big push of, of common schema for logs, uh, which I think has all standardized around um, um, the, the new hotel logging schema. And as a lot of folks are already using Fluentbit for logs, we really wanna make sure that as an ecosystem partner, you're gonna be able to take those raw logs and, and schematize those uh, very, very fast and, and effectively. So what we've what we've been doing is looking at ways to make it really simple to take things like, hey, I've got Nginx logs, I've got Apache logs, I've got uh, some of these AWS services um, that are running, and I want to convert that into the schema that the community is going to, you know, has defined and, and using. So let's let me go ahead and switch back to my my terminal here. We're going to go into the hotel schema processor. You can see there's a GitHub link there, so you're very encouraged to, to go check it out. Uh, actually, same thing with the observability demo. If you want to peer under the hood, look at look at all of it. That's that's all there in a GitHub uh, repo as well. I'll link it in the, the chat right after. And within this, let's look at something like uh, CloudFront. So I have CloudFront. Uh, let's take a look at some of these sample logs for CloudFront, right? You can see that they are you know, very text. These are these are what you kind of expect with logs. There's some format that was arbitrary defined way back when. This is kind of like a networking based format. It, it looks like it's tab separated, and you know I don't know if other folks have memorized this type of format, but at least for me, when I look at this, I have no idea what's going on. Right? I'm not going to be able to tell you that this is something useful, this is something that, wow, we should we should really check into. Um, I can see some things here like HTTP method and, and whatnot, but one of the great things about, you know, having a large overarching project like OpenTelemetry is, hey, these logs should conform to some sort of schema and, and that schema should be present across multiple different data types. If I have a log like this and an Apache log, and they both have an HTTP method. We should have that the same uh, same thing for that. So what we what we did um, uh, late last year, and it's going to be something that we're going to continue to do for 2024, is add these like out of the box processors that uh, are are within Lua. So take a look at that. Let's go ahead and take CloudFront Hotel dot Lua. And effectively, it defines what all of this stuff is, and then uh, reads in that raw log, and then makes it into the the format that matches uh, that that hotel schema. And what's great about that is if we have a backend that knows how to visualize hotel schema. So in, in the case where we developed these, it was for Open Search, and um, and and the community there had built some dashboards that pull off the hotel schema. You just get instant. Uh, light up of all this stuff. And you can say the same thing for any other services that are going to receive uh, OTLP, schematized logs. We convert it, we send it, and you almost just get this immediate light up of your dashboards that might be pulling from that. So let's go run this now. Oh, that's kind of ugly. Let's put it through. JQ. And now, wow, great. We have a, a schema here, right? Something that's actually uh, okay to look at. Now I can see, okay, event. My event type is a get. The domain is within AWS uh, and, and much more attuned to the, um, the, the schema that's, that's there and defined within OpenTelemetry. So this is another way of, of taking some of the ways that we've interacted with logs for well, quite a while, adding some processing out of the box 
uh, and, and making sure that we get a good experience for users uh, that are leveraging this, that have backends that understand um, the, the open telemetry protocol uh, and, and something we're going to continue to, to work on. So this is, you can see, still very much work in progress, always looking for good community uh, requests and, and, and what's going on there. I'm happy to, to make sure that uh, we can keep, keep adding good value there. A couple of questions. Um, can I retrieve custom Windows performance counter with Flumpit and send that as a metric to an OTEL collector endpoint? Not a scrape. Uh, good question. Uh, we, we can read, uh, so Flumpit includes Windows Exporter, uh, Process Exporter, and Node Exporter across both Windows and, and Linux. Obviously, Windows Exporter for Windows, Node Exporter for Linux. But you can also do custom um, WMI queries, WMI um, uh, metrics in there. And from that, the metrics that we collect within Fluentbit, they get converted into what's called a C metric. And that C metric can be converted into a Prometheus remote write, a Prometheus exporter, uh, or in the case of OpenTelemetry, we can send it to OpenTelemetry metrics endpoint, um, which could be the collector just listening to uh, OTEL metrics. So yes, the answer is, Yes, you can do it. You don't need to host it on an endpoint and have something scrape. Uh, there are, are quite a quite a ways to, to go in and accomplish that. And hey, now you can just do it with one uh, kind of agent. You don't need to throw Windows Exporter plus Fluentbit plus uh, another scraper of, of Hotel Collector on, on that. I know that's that's not fun. And I think there was one comment in the chat. Nice seeing the Grafana queries. Yeah, happy to give you some view into that. Let's just go into the explore. Um, this is the Prometheus one. Again, it all, I'll, I'll share that uh, that GitHub repo, you do a Docker compose up, it all just uh, starts running. And then here are all the metrics. The one that we really care about is this you know, up metric, uh, if you will, right? If it's, hey, is this thing running? Here's the instance, um, here's the job. Okay, with that, let's get back to the presentation. And I will hand it back off to you, Brayden. Oh, you're muted. All right, uh, we were at the data model, right? Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, right. Okay. Good. I unmuted. All right. Um, so I'm gonna real quick go over a little bit about what the OTLP data model looks like. Yeah, uh, you'll have to bear with me. This part's slightly dry, but it feeds into the next slide, so I'm gonna go go over it real quick. Um, OTLP is very specifically designed as a uh, hierarchical data model, so um, it's very focused on if you have data, understanding. Uh, you know, what produced that data and, uh, and, and being able to use that to correlate uh, across data signals. <clears throat> this is very different if you're familiar with, more familiar with Prometheus. Prometheus is specifically designed to be a flat data model. It's just data points. Uh, OTLP is instead hierarchical. And that hierarchy starts with a resource, which is uh, a representation of the resource that's actually producing telemetry. So a resource could, for example, be uh, a Kubernetes pod, uh, where you'd have the uh, or pod pod name, resource name, zone. Like there's a few different possible resource attributes you could have to describe. This is these are metrics or logs or or spans coming from this Kubernetes pod. Um, the instrumentation scope uh, is a, an understanding of how the data was actually instrumented. Uh, so it was data that is coming from a uh, an open telemetry language library. Like if you're a Java application, you're using the Java library, uh, you're writing metrics or logs or, or spans with that. Uh, those will automatically already be, uh, the, the library knows how to set up the instrumentation scope such that when you look at the data after, you know, these are metrics that came from the Java client library. And that's the same with like the open telemetry collector, for example, they will have uh, scope attributes that says this came from an open telemetry collector of this version. Uh, and then finally within that, you have the actual events. 
Uh, these events, they're nested within the scope, whereas the scope is nested within a resource. Uh, the events will be basically the actual logs and metric data points and, or spans, whichever one it is. There's only one type of data per OTLP, data, uh, ter, per OTLP payload. Um, the, the schema does kind of make it look like they could technically be mixed, but most of the time OTLP endpoints are per type. So on the OpenSlumetry collector, for example, the o, OTLP receiver uh, actually takes it, it has three, it has three like API endpoints, one for logs, one for metrics and one for traces. Uh, but overall the, the hierarchical structure, uh, it's, it's important because the protocol doesn't actually, if, if you remember that, uh, that original slide where I talked about what the open telemetry project is and what it represents. One of the things that it does not cover is a storage backend. Um, it's very focused on just the data and the protocol and not trying to be prescriptive about how that data is stored or how it's interpreted. Uh, and that's why this hierarchical structure is important. Uh, if the resource attributes look a certain way and the vendor says how they're supposed to look, all you have to do is change the attributes up a little bit and suddenly you can have whatever nice backend features this vendor has versus what another vendor has. Um, and they might all have different rules for this or they may follow the open telemetry semantic conventions uh, which is a, a, another central documentation uh, set for like, this is what we say the resource attributes for uh, a VM should be, or what for a Kubernetes process, or the, this is what the instrumentation scope for library should be, or this is what JVM, the JVM resource should look like, or things like that. Um, you might be following those semantic conventions, or you might need to follow specific conventions from your backend. But overall, it's very important that uh, you can access resource and instrumentation scope and make them work the way you need to. And this is leading into my wish list. Um, in terms of the agents that I've evaluated for OTLP uh, functionality, um, nobody quite matches what the Open Telemetry Collector offers, given that it's the first party offering from the Open Telemetry Project. It makes sense that it would be the most full feature for OTLP. Fluentbit is the second best, in my opinion, of the agents that I looked at for OTLP use cases, but it still is only uh, covering basic use cases because it's missing a few features and it's namely missing uh, access to resource and scope attributes. Um, when you produce data, if you send data, OTLP data in to FluentBit, if you send metrics or span data into FluentBit, it will maintain the resource and scope um, but you can't add or change the attributes inside of FluentBit. Um, and that is really important for a lot of more advanced use cases or working with specific vendors is the ability to add or modify those. Um, you might've mentioned I only said metrics and traces before for maintaining resource and scope. And that's because of a current bug where OTLP logging uh, actually drops those. If you send OTLP logs with resource and scope attributes from a client library or from another collector into FluentBit, uh, FluentBit accidentally drops them. Uh, it, it doesn't process them. And then, and then if you try and send that same OTLP data back out, the resource and scope won't be there. And this uh, makes it kind of a non-starter for some logging use cases. Uh, but it sounds like uh, there's plans to fix both of these. Uh, Anuraga, I'm not sure if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. I mean, like I said in the beginning of the session too, this is the best way to, to get fixes is come on present and yes, we're gonna we're gonna uh, get it. You know, I think o OTLP and, and open telemetry with Limpet have been just this continual little community effort. Um, and this is the best way uh, for, for us is like, as users start leveraging it more, uh, we get more reports and then we, we can uh, higher prioritize these things. So these are uh, two great examples of like, how do we make sure that this works really well, not just for like a small set of use cases, but the ones that our, our, our users want. So um, again, this is a big shout out to all the folks you know, who are joining the webinar from the community. Uh, we really rely on your feedback, your your issues um, to, to kind of help prioritize and get these get these results. So um, this is great we love to, to see it. Yeah, thanks. Both of, the, both of these issues that I linked, uh, I go into more detail about um, the actual issues and reproduction scenarios for both of these issues. Um, so you can go check those out if you want and give them a plus one if you're interested. Um, 
overall, I think if these two things are fixed, Fluent Bit is going to become a much more uh, competitive option in the open telemetry space. It's not going to be just a, a single answer for OTLP. There is going to be an alternative. There's going to be more competition, and I'm really excited for that. Um, if you're listening to this and thinking about, I hear the open telemetry collector and I hear about Fluent Bit, and I'm not sure why I should choose one or the other. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through some of my, my, these are purely my opinions about the pros and cons of each. For the open telemetry collector, um, it is really well made. Uh, it is fully featured for OTLP, especially. It's designed for OTLP as a first class citizen, being that it's a first party offering from the open telemetry project. Uh, so it's very good if you are, if you're very focused on OTLP, like you work with a vendor who wants to accept OTLP data as a first class citizen, uh, the open telemetry collector today, like if you had to choose right now is pretty much your best option. Um, it also has some more features for push-based metrics. Um, Fluidbit's Prometheus support is very good and Prometheus remote write support is quite good. Um, open telemetry collector has a lot of alternative options for just pushing metrics to different vendors. A lot of vendors are very heavily involved in creating exporters for the open telemetry collector. Um, for example, on even our Google Cloud exporter for Fluentbit, right now it only processes logs. Um, it will only send logs to Google Cloud Logging, whereas our exporter in Open Telemetry Collector, we were able to push all three. Um, so that's another example. If you are really focused on this push-based metric workflow, Open Telemetry Collector might be a better option. Um, in my opinion, the resource usage controls and limiters are easier to understand in the Open Telemetry Collector and a bit easier to, uh, to configure. And I've already been talking with Eduardo and Anurag about some opinions and challenges we've been experiencing with Fluent Bits. Um, in general, the OTO Collector and my biggest problem with it really is that it's uh, far more resource intensive than the alternatives. Um, it suffers a lot of the same problems as any, it's any Go binary that has to depend on gRPC is gonna run into this problem of just this gigantic binary with uh, so much data in it that when you load it into memory, all of a sudden you're paying like hundred megabytes of RAM just to load the program before doing anything. Uh, and it means that you have to uh, do a lot of work to like pick the smallest OTEL binary uh, you know, you don't want to be running the full open telemetry collector contrib in production. In most cases, you want to be using something like the open telemetry collector builder to only get the components you care about, uh, or using a specific distribution that is limited for different vendors. Um, it also is the open telemetry project has a lot of momentum. It's the second most contributed project in the CNCF. Um, and it is changing a lot and changing quickly. And in my opinion, I, like changing for the better, like it, it has been getting incredibly good over the past two years. Um, but it does mean that you need to pay a little bit more attention and keep up to date on a wider breadth of things for the Open Telemetry Collector. You sort of need to stay, keep up to date and stay involved in the community to keep up with what's going on. Uh, talking a little bit about Fluent Bit, uh, the biggest plus in my opinion is that it is extremely lightweight, um, very efficient um, in my sort of benchmarking evaluation work, I've found that Fluentbit uh, uses far less resources for the same workload uh, over the open telemetry collector. Um, for file-based log collection, uh, the throughput I've been able to get is very high. So if you have extremely high throughput, like 150 megabytes a second of logs, for example, like that sort of thing, Fluentbit can chug along, whereas the open telemetry collector probably can't measure up yet. Um, it's, it is missing some features for OTLP, like I mentioned before. So if you're very focused on uh, full featured OTLP, uh, it's probably, you're gonna wanna go for the collector for now and then check in with Fluent Bit once uh, some of the issues have been addressed. Um, and currently not all metric exporters, it's the inverse of, of before, not all exporters are supporting metrics export right now. It's possible that some others aren't. I, I know Google Cloud, we, for out stack driver, I'm not sure if we are planning to add that as uh, we would probably prefer to invest in the open telemetry collector for that use case, but for logs still fluent bit is still a high priority for us. Um, there's a bit of a uh, 
configuration learning curve for Fluentbit, the resource usage controls compared to what the OpenTelemetry collector offers. Um, I don't think that what Fluentbit has is bad. I'm not, I'm not trying to say it's bad, but I think it is harder to understand. It takes a little bit more um, cognizance to understand the resource usage controls and make sure that you're keeping it under some sort of target memory usage goal or something like that. Um, so really there's reasons to choose either one um, or you could use them both together for different use cases. Um, I don't, I don't think any either one is better or worse than the other. Uh, it entirely depends on what your use case is. Um, I did a talk at KubeCon in November. Um, if you look up Braden Kane's agent performance on YouTube, you should be able to find it. Um, but in that, I talked about some of the uh, performance challenges that different agents can experience. And at the end, I talked a little bit about how to evaluate the agent for yourself and decide on which agent to use for your use case. Um, so if you're interested in, in making a choice like this, I'd recommend checking out that talk and especially the sort of last uh, 10, 15 minutes to, for some strategies on that. I wanted to finish off by showing a little bit what, about what I mean with the resource usage. Um, this graph is the uh, CPU time of the process of the, uh, of the open telemetry process and a fluid bit process both collecting basically the same amount of logs. Um, they're pretty close. Like this is a uh, CPU time of nanoseconds because neither of these agents are really doing a whole lot of work. I think they're collecting a megabyte of logs a second in this example. Uh, so, you know, they're pretty close in the CPU aspect, but when it comes to memory, uh, <laughs> this little line down here is fluent bit only taking about 22 megabytes of RAM just to be loaded and do very little work. Whereas OpenTelemetry Collector, uh, this entirely depends on which collector you choose, which build of it you choose, which distribution. Everyone is a different size because they're including different no amounts of components. Um, but for the build that I was using, uh, this is using, I think 110 or 112 sort of megabytes just to not do very much work, which is uh, a little bit disappointing, but I think uh, because open telemetry is sort of, they really want you to build your own collector with the minimal number of, uh, of components. And this is also just a, an after effect of being written in Go in general. That's sort of the reason that if you are in, that's sort of the reason that it's bigger than you would think. Um, so if you're in like a heavily resource constrained environment, Fluentbit is a, a very good option. If you're worried about your collector getting out of memory killed or anything like that. You know, Fluentbit is a really good alternative if you're having that problem. Uh, I think that's everything that I had. Um, I can keep presenting for the last couple of slides if we want, or I can hand it off. Cool. Uh, you, can, you can keep sharing. I don't mind talking through sure. it. Um, but we do have a, a free book of Fluentbit with Kubernetes. So I know there was a, a Kubernetes question earlier. Okay. Definitely grab a, um, a copy. This is in early access, so it'll keep... Uh, um, it, it'll keep keep coming um, chapter after chapter. This is, uh, you know, you can get that that copy, uh, no problem. And next slide. Uh, we just announced the Fluentbit Academy. So one thing we've heard a lot of good feedback on is folks like these type of webinar sessions that are a little bit more hands-on, that have some Git repos. Uh, so we'll absolutely keep uh, keep adding to that. And so the Fluentbit Academy uh, is, is going to have more of those like trainings and workshops and uh, environments. Uh, we, we use, um, you know, a couple of virtual labs. So having that is, uh, if you're interested in that, please, please be sure to, to sign up. Um, and you can uh, see some of that on the, the, the Clipkit page if you want to see some of the past sessions, past trainings and, and whatnot. Um, there were a couple of good Q&A um, that, that came in. Of course, please, other folks, if you have more Q&A, please just throw, throw them into, uh, into the chat. One is about, can we add tags to attributes and resources in Flipit today? In the past, they end up in the body where the body is a JSON object with the message plus tag as fields. And one of the big changes with the latest version of Flipit 2.2 is actually the entirety of the structure of, uh, of a message. So before it used to just be timestamp tag record um, and, and tags are used for routing. The timestamp of course is the what's used to dictate well, when, it, when it happened, the record can be that, that whole body attribute. 
Uh, within 2.2, we expanded it so it's not just timestamp tag, but you now have a metadata field. It's all backwards compatible, of course. And this was really in response to how do we make sure that we can work really, really well um, with, with some of these things like, hey, I have attributes, I have metadata, I have um, all, all of these pieces. Uh, in the specific of like adding tags to attributes and the resource side, I think part of this was one of the gaps that uh, you know Brandon mentioned maybe in the log side. Uh, I do think there is some stuff there within the metrics and trace piece, but uh, definitely, you know, I again say say thanks. Like this is where, oh, as we have more users leveraging this and and uh, you know giving us this type of feedback, we we've been able to hammer out quite a few of these um, these uh, incompatibilities or issues or or gaps um, within the the two dot zero and two dot one series. Yeah, if you're talking about uh, adding adding resource attributes in OTLP data. Um, this was what one of the issues I linked was about. Um, there is, there's a bug with OTLP logs where it will accidentally drop resource and scope attributes entirely. And that will be addressed at, uh, at some point. Um, but I had another issue where I was talking about like adding resource attributes or scope attributes to any OTLP data. And right now, Fluentbit doesn't support that. So that is one of the gaps. And if you're interested in that, please go uh, plus one on the issue. I'll link it in the uh, webinar chat yeah. in general so folks can take a look. Awesome. And is there a plan to support encodings of logs other than UTF-8? In the past, I could not get logs to be parsed properly unless they're written using UTF-8. Uh, I thought we had gone all the way to UTF-16. This one might be yeah. uh, one I'll have to I'll have to follow up with you, Carlos. You're, you're asking good, good technical questions. Um, yeah, this is a problem we had too. We used to have an issue with uh, Windows event logs when they would yeah. when we would we would they, basically fluent it would assume it was UTF eight, and so it would render everything as like thing and then space and then character and then space and then character. Okay. <laughs> Just, my yeah. my favorite is there's a character that is zero length space. And you're like, wait, what? And and it exists, and it it's like uh, something zero 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 f or something like that when, when it's encoded. I, I have seen that before, and I do think there was some some work done to to help with it. But yeah, again, Carlos, you you've asked a good a good one. I'll have to dig in the code a little bit to to get back to you. If you're in the Fluent Slack channel, just give me a ping as a, as an IOU. Any other uh, questions that folks uh, have here uh, for, for me or Brayden? Happy to answer any of that. Okay. Otherwise, then, thanks so much for joining. And yeah, we look forward to uh, having another one of these, most likely, in, in the next month or so. H happy holidays for those celebrating, and catch you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks all. Bye.